if they ran in their mouth. Yeah, they looking for trouble. Ran right up in the night. Now they back in the hall. Now they know we can fight. Content give it every week. Me and your she mine. He won't bring you the heat. Now they know that we hit. And they know we quit. Yo, she buy the chicken. Keep on bringing the game. Give me the unit, the unit. Cause they know we ain't stopping. And they know they got problems. And they ran out of houses. Look, we know we got a problem. Can't let it go unsolved. Bring bass line and afro set your history. We seen them all. Uh, karma is karma. I say what I say. I hear the wall. Uh, Till I see y'all fall off. Then I bring y'all up on all. I'm back up on my Clyde winners. Clyde winners. Clyde winners. Uh, Clyde winners. Clyde winners. Clyde winners. Uh, 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 Clyde winners. Uh,
I want to talk to you about, in a sense, how important it was that uh, that uh, even the uh, Moors were Vikings, you know. It, it's, it's so much that, that we've been taught that's a lie. And because we've been taught so many lies, it takes, it takes a lot of time for us to really get an understanding of our actual history. You see, because we've been taught, you know, things that, that, are, that, that are just so patently untrue. But because of the fact that they exist, because of the fact that we've been told these things are true, we, uh, we really believe a lot of these things. And uh, it's, it's sad, it's sad that, uh, that we don't really, you know, admit the fact that, no, we don't know about these things. You know, for example, they want to teach you all the time. You know, they wrote, we had a big argument back in the 90s. This uh, guy wrote this book about the uh, Hoxas. And in, uh, and in his book, he wrote a, a three-volume a three volume series. And he talked about the fact that the Hoxas were, uh, were really Hebrews and that they were really, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, people, from, people from Asia that conquered Egypt. You know, this is a lie. But, you know, the European has been teaching this lie for a hundred, for, you know, over a hundred years now, you see, because the Hoxas were really, in a sense, that was the name of the Kushites that lived in Lower Egypt. In fact, in fact, Hoxas was the name of, uh, of, of, of the people that was led by, uh, you know, uh, Minis or, or, or uh, you know, uh, the, the first unifier of ancient Egypt. Yes, yes, he called himself a Hoxa because he saw himself as a Kushite, you see. And what makes it very bad, how you doing, uh, Roz, 56, where I cush, you know, it's, excuse me, it's just so sad that we just accept everything without really doing any research on our own. You know, it's time that that we do some good research. JP, she did a very beautiful book on uh, on the uh, ancient, uh, ancient people in Southeast Asia, you know. And see, we need more people to do research like this. We need more people to really, you know, apply themselves to teaching the truth, you know, teaching us reality instead of these lies because... We uh we learn so many lies that after a while we don't know what if we're coming or going. But what we have to do is we have to, in a sense, you know, sometimes reevaluate much of the evidence, reevaluate much of the evidence that we've been taught. Because much of what we've been taught is just pure decongestion, purity lies. You see, the European, he has to teach us lies. And the reason that he has to teach us lies is because by teaching us lies, that allows him to be able to to be a part, to be a part of, of ancient history, to be a part of world history, you see. We often forget that um, that Europeans, they've only dominated the uh, world for, uh, they only dominated the world in a, in a sense for less than a hundred years, but, but, but now they're still controlling the world because the fact that people don't know their history, you see. They only took over Africa in 1899, you know, when they had the, uh, the conference that decided on what European powers would, would split Africa and what European powers would rule this state or that state. And that's when they began to uh, name the various states in Africa. Okay, they may have, uh, they may have uh, ruled India, you know, a little, maybe uh, about 50 to 100 years early, but even then they were still fighting the Rajas and other, uh, other uh, groups. How are you doing out there, Martin? But the point is, is that we've been conditioned to believe that Europeans have ruled the world for, for 2,000 years. No, no, no. You know, how you doing, Create So Far? Create So Far Junior. You know, because see, the thing is, this is that it's it's uh it, it it's very important that we understand this. And you know, create create has stated, I'm so glad to start to start informing my family about this history so I can break them out of the the illusion and distorted reality of second frequency. True. You know, because but see, we we've been conditioned to believe whatever sec, second fre frequency says. We have so many people today, so many people. We even have a couple of scholars at places like Howard University that teach a meta nature, which is the uh, language of the uh, of the ancient Egyptians. Although many of us know meta nature, none of us really do the research. We don't really check. We don't really check to see if some of the information that we've been taught over the years by these Eurocentric scholars in relationship to ancient Egypt, you know, ancient Israel. We, 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 we never check to see if, if, if what they've taught us and what we're teaching other people is the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you see? I'm a falsificationist. As a falsificationist, I can't really say I can prove anything because, see, new research, 
may contradict whatever I say. But I can say that the research at a particular point in time may confirm a theory. And uh, all of the research today confirms that, that most of the ancient civilizations in the river valleys, Sumer, ancient Egypt, the uh, Indus Valley, all of these civilizations were formed by various black people. You know, these black people, in a sense, they were not unitary. You know, they were not, in a sense, a homogenous group. You know, black people come in all sizes, all shapes, and all hues. And this is something that we have to, we have to really remember. But, you know, we've been conditioned, in a sense, to feel that, that, that using the term black is a, is a derogatory term. Using the term black is, as a people is it, so derogatory because the fact, in a sense, that we've been conditioned by Europeans to believe that, that using that word black to identify a, a people, to identify a nation, is, is, is utterly, uh, utterly impossible. And you find learned people, people who went to college, people who, who, who've read the literature on ancient Sumer, the Assyrians, you see, tell us that there was never any people on earth that called themselves black. This is wrong. The Sumerians, they called, they called themselves Sagiga. They called themselves, in a sense, the black people. The same thing for the Assyrians. They called themselves the same name, the Assyrians, you see? And then, then the people who founded the uh, ancient civilization in, in, in China, they called themselves Xi, Xi, the black people. And of course, the greatest civilization in the history of the world, ancient Egypt. They called themselves Kamitru or Kamiju. You see, how you doing, Team Zulu? They call themselves the black people. And they said their land was the black land. And yet you continually, even to this day, hear black people, you know, tell you that there's never been a black nation and there's never been a nation where people identify themselves as black. And that's a lie. We've always had Egypt in front of our eyes. We always knew what, what, what the Egyptians called themselves. And yet people continue to tell this lie. And they continue to tell this lie because they prefer to be what's called second frequency. And second frequency is a term in a sense that we use to identify the so-called Caucasian people, you see. But see, so we take on this jargon, we take on this reality, but this reality is based upon lies, you see. You know, but today we're gonna we're gonna go real deep. How you doing, D Foster? We're gonna go real deep, and 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 I really I'm, I'm really excited because I'm gonna talk a lot about the Moors, you know. But what I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk about the Moors and how many of many people were already Moorish people even before the European got here. We know we know in a sense that that when the Spanish explorers came, they they often brought uh, Moorish Moorish uh, you know interpreters. And one of the reasons that they brought uh, Moorish interpreters is that the Moors have been been trading with people in the uh, in North America and South America and Central America, Mexico, for hundreds of years. As a result, there were many people, there were many people in North America and South America who were either Muslims, Hebrews, or uh, or they knew or they had somebody in the village who could speak Hebrew or or uh, or in a sense uh, Arabic. And the reason, in a sense, that they could they could do it is because you got to remember is that Arabic, Hebrew, they're what's called Semitic languages, and the, all the Semitic languages they share, they share, you know, certain uh, certain uh, you know certain key terms, certain base words, and and so if you if you could speak Hebrew, you could just about make up uh, make up Arabic. How you doing, Tom's Fi? You guys, in a sense, as we as I try to tell you, Tom's Fi. He makes some very beautiful jewelry, and his jewelry is based upon styles that were that were made by Aboriginal people. You know, check him out. You know, try to uh, look up Tones Fi and and buy some of his products. How you doing, Jade Sucra? You know, B one. You know, black first, and we had to be black first. And when you when you declare that you're B one, when you declare that you're B one, you're not you're not putting yourself out on a limb. You're not you're not putting yourself away. How you doing, Carol? Carol Asbarum? You know, you are you are being in a sense following the tradition of the ancient civilized civilized nations, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians. These people ruled the world. And the reason that they were able to rule the world is because they accepted their blackness, you see. And see, but we've been conditioned to feel that oh, black is negative, black is evil, you know. But the point is, this is that they still identify themselves as blacks because they recognize that they were the children of God. How you doing, uh, 
Kesa and Thomas, and they felt that they were the children of God because of the fact, yes, because of the fact that they understood that God was the ruler and that God, you know, when you read the Bible, when you read the Quran, it says that the first man, Adamu, was black. That means the first man and woman on earth was black. And so when you're calling yourself a black person, as in foundational black American, what you're doing in a sense is that you're you're tapping into that ancient that ancient culture. You're tapping into our ancestors, you see, because you're not you're not estranged. You're not a stranger. You're not lost, you see. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And uh, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna uh, you know get into it right now. And uh, you know uh, the white man knew. Yes, yes. See, we've been conditioned. We've been conditioned over the years to believe in a sense that everything, everything that we see, everything that, that we see is new. Everything is under, you know, is a, it, it has to be true if the European says it. But the white man knew about black Muslims and Islam in America before Columbus. You see, in fact, they even came here, you know. When, when, these, when, these, uh, when these Europeans, when they landed on, on the uh, North American and South American continent, they found they found black people who are wearing Islamic garb. You see, they found in Mexico people around the pyramids, you know, performing dua, you know, dua. In other words, in a sense, they were praising God. They were praying to God. They were they were letting God know who and what they were because they many of these uh, people in Mexico were Muslims. Yes, yes. And then on the other side, on the left hand side, we see pictures of the Yamasi. These are the Yamasi people. The Yamasi people, they were a North American, North American Aboriginal group that lived down in, in Georgia, lived down in, 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 uh, in Florida. And look at their garb. Here you can see the brother in the middle, the big brother in the middle. He's got on a kufi hat. Then behind him, there's a brother with a turban. And then we see ahead of them, we see our brothers with these red and white wraps, you know, around their head, tied in, with a tie in the back, you know, looking like a do-rag, you see fighting, fighting. Do you understand that that these traditions, these traditions that are common, you know, it was, it was common when I was growing up and even oh, even today over the summer, you see a lot of brothers with a do-rag tied around their head when it gets warm. And so then these traditions that we carry, these cultural patterns that we carry as foundational Black Americans are not new. These cultural, pa these cultural patterns have a great antiquity, you see. Go to my Patreon to see the slides. Please join my Patreon. My Patreon, the people of my Patreon, they support my research. They're, uh, they're the reason that I can do much of the research that I do because, see, much of the material that I need and to do up-to-date work, research, a lot of stuff is behind what's called a paywall. What a paywall is is that for many uh, newspaper articles, yes, newspaper articles and, and magazine and journal articles, they're behind a paywall. You may have to pay as much as 39 to a hundred dollars just to read an article. See, I'm not talking about buying an article. I'm talking about just to read an article. And therefore, when people join my Patreon and they support me on a monthly basis, what they're doing in a sense is they're allowing me to have access to this to this material. Sometimes I have to buy new books, and these books cost a lot of money. And I had to buy these books in the sense to make sure that when I come to you every Thursday, that I'm presenting to you the latest research, the latest knowledge so that you will not, in a sense, get information that doesn't have receipts, you know. Uh, go to my uh, my YouTube channel, and that's where you're at right now. And here I have over 300 videos on uh, my uh, YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel, you know, you can find every aspect of Black history. Yes, every aspect of Black history on every continent. And uh, you can order my books at Amazon.com. So uh, please support me and uh, join my Patreon, buy my books. Please support me so I can continue to do this research, you see. I uh, just published a new book uh, last year. It was called The Soul of Islam, The History of Sunni Islam in the Americas. In this book, I give you, a, I give you the only, I give you the only book that explains to you the rise of Islam in the Americas. You're not going to find another book that discusses this. They may talk about uh, Muslims in Brazil, maybe Muslims in America. None of them hardly discuss Muslims in the Caribbean. But you get my book, The Soul of Islam, The History of Sunni Islam in the Americas, you're going to find about 
this this Islamic tradition. You know, we've heard a lot about the black Muslims. But what I've done is that I've looked at us Sunni Muslims, and these are supposed to be the so-called Orthodox Muslims. So this is what the book is about. If you want to find out more information, get my book, The World History of the Black Race. This book will explain to you every black nation that ever existed on the planet Earth. They're all in my book, The World History of the Black Race. So uh, check it out. You know, and, and of course, I'm very excited about my, my, my latest book I published just a couple of weeks ago, and it's History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals in America. You know, there's a lot of books, and these books, when they talk about black Indians, they always talk about uh, black Indians as if as if the uh, black Indians were had been slaves of the uh, of the red man, and that or they had run away from slavery. But see, in my book, the history and culture of the black Aboriginals in America, I provide the only. I provide the only story about the various aboriginal black tribes that were in the americas for over a hundred thousand years yes the first black the first black aboriginals that that we know of were in california hundred thirty thousand years ago you see but they've they've been able in a sense to 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 continue to be their presence has continued to be here you know but we always think in in these other books when they talk about black indians they make they make it appear as though that the uh that the only black indians where uh, people were slaves of the uh, various uh, red man or, or the white man. You see, but in this book, History and Culture of the uh, Black Aboriginals in America, here's uh, some of the stuff from the Table of Continents, uh, Contents. I give you an introduction where I talk about the background to uh, Aboriginals in the Americas. You know, I explain who the dark-skinned people of the Americas was. I give you an African background to the Paleo-Americans. The Paleo-Americans, that's the name that they've given to the original people that lived in America. You see, these people lived in America before the red man even got here, because the red man, um, the skeletal remains, or most archaeologists don't see the red man coming here until 4000 BC. By that time, by that time, uh, you know, uh, black uh, aboriginals have been here for over 96,000 years. You know, uh, then a uh, a chapter on Paleo America of the Ancient World, who were the mound builders in the United States, uh, the Thanksgiving origin of the Maafa. I also, also uh, uh, given a, I also have a chap, chapter on what I call the, uh, you know, the uh, shuffle. And this shuffle is the fact that many black people, sometimes when they go to these uh, these powwows, a lot of times, you know, the red men, the red people, the red Indians will pull them off the uh, the dances when they're dancing out there. They will sometimes go and attack the black people and, and say, you're not, you're not, you're not an, an American Indian. You're not a Native American. And they're right. They're not Native Americans. They're Aboriginal Americans. Our, our, our black ancestors who, who, who came to America 130,000 years ago, these people are not the red man, you see. These people are the black man, the copper colored people who were described as being black by the colonists. The white man knew about black Muslims and Islam in America before Columbus. What is FBA? Well, I'm an FBA, so let me t tell you what an FBA is. FBA is not a group. FBA is not an organization. FBA is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry, or pedigree. As a result, we are descendants of the African and Aboriginal Blacks who built the United States. Yes, yes, the African and Aboriginal Blacks. There was also some Black Irish, but uh, that's a little too long, so I'll just stick to those two for the time being. B1 is acknowledging your Black African ancestry and mod, not heritage. We must be race men and women proud of our culture and African Black ancestry. B1, Black first. Why Black first? Because see, we're continually we're continually kept down in this country because of the fact that instead of instead of supporting one another, instead of in a sense recognizing the, the unity of who we are, we often in a sense began to 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 bring up our, our nationalities, our, our national heritages that, that that keep us divided. I'm a Christian. I'm a Protestant. No, 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 no. I'm a Muslim. No, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Moor. And so we're continually bringing, I'm a Yuchi, I'm a Cherokee. We're continually bringing up these, these national heritages instead of acknowledging the fact that, that we're B1. We're foundational Black Americans. And the reason that we can be foundational Black Americans is because they were all described as being Black. 
And we know that the greatest people on earth, the Assyrians, the ancient Egyptians, they all called themselves black. The Sumerians, they all said they were black. That tells you something. That tells you when you identify as a black person, when you identify as a black nationality, you are in conformity with, with, with the creator. You are in conformity with the per first people of the earth. Because as I mentioned earlier, Adam in the Bible was black. is made of the soil. Or red of the red earth. Don't you forget this. We have been taught a history of lies. Yes, yes. We've been taught so many lies. And, and history's greatest lies have come from the European. And these lies were made up so that he could place himself in history. Because Europeans, they don't have an, an ancient history. They don't have a history in a sense that, that lasted longer than 200 years. Rome, 200 years. Greece, maybe 200 years. Look at uh, Britain, 200 years. America, 200 years. And now they're in decline. Why? Because they these second frequency people, these Caucasian people, they don't know how to, in a sense, share. They don't know how to relate to one another. They don't know how to, in a sense, be in conformity with, with God Almighty. And so then, therefore, in a sense, they lose themselves. And, in, and after a while, they lose their civilization. As a rule under white supremacy, history is whatever white people say it is. Even though archaeologists have found ancient artifacts of blacks, the white supremacists demand that you ignore what you can see with your own eyes and replace it with images they make up. Yes, yes, yes. The study of Muslims in America began in 1979. Yes, yes. I was the first researcher to write a history of the black Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. It all began with an article I published in Ali Hat called Islam in Early North and South America in 1977. Yes, 1977. It was this article that began interest among scholars in the history of Muslims and Islam among blacks from slavery to contemporary times. Yes, yes. You know, a lot of people like Austin, the University of Chicago, all these other people, every one of them, they copied off my article. They copied off my paper. Yes, they copied off my research because, as I have told you, you see, one of the things that I decided when I was 10 years old, and you'll find this in my memoir, you know, Paths, you know, Pathfinder. You'll find in my memoir that I discussed the fact that I wanted to be the first. And that's what it is. I want it to be the first to find out any historical event that happened with black people. And that's what I did in terms of writing about the Muslims in the Americas, you see. You know, some of my articles I wrote back in the day was a survey of the African diaspora. Pan-African Journal, Roots of Islam and Slave America, Afro-American Muslims from Slavery to Freedom. You know, the Muslims of Rio de Janeiro, the Afro-Brazilian concept of jihad and the 1835 slave revolt. A chronology of Islam in Afro-America, origin of Muslim slaves. And I wrote even more articles because, see, I wanted to make sure in a sense that people knew about this event because, see, we often, when we looked at Malcolm X, we often said, damn, hey, how did he have this? Why did we do this? And what I want to do is I want to show that there's been a long history of people, you know. My new book on the history of Islam in the Americas provides much history relating to Islam in the Americas. A very interesting article was written by Brent Singleton. It was called Uma Slowly Bled, a select bibliography of enslaved African Muslims in the Americas and the Caribbean. You see, this article is a source of Black Muslim Islam in the Western Hemisphere. Yes, it's a, it's a source. It gives you, it gives you in a sense, a list of some articles that you can refer to. But most of the articles that <laughs> most of the people wrote those articles, they were following my research. Yes, my research. That's why if you really want to learn about Muslims. If you really want to look, learn about Islam in the Western Hemisphere, get my book, The Soul of Islam. Today, many Muslims believe that America has always been an economic mecca for Muslims. Oh, this is their opinion. Many African Muslims came to America before slavery. Yes, yes, yes. They see America as, as a place where Muslims can be free. They see America as a place that, that is a home, you know. But this isn't a new thing. Muslims have been in America for hundreds of years before the Europeans got here. This is evident when we look at the Yamasi Indians fighting the British during the Yamasi War. Yes, look at these Indians, you see? Look at them. If we move, if we move in a sense from left to right, what do we see? We see brothers with with with, with do bags, with do rags tied around their head, red and white two rag, two um do rags. Then we see a brother in the middle, you know, he's got his shield and he's and he's and he's moving forward and he wears a kufi hat. 
And then finally we see a brother in the back with a, with a turban and a feather in the turban. Yes, yes, yes. What does that tell you? These are Aboriginal people. These are Aboriginal, these aren't Africans. These aren't Africans. These are Aboriginal Americans. Foundational Black Americans. Look at what they're wearing. That tells you that Islam, Muslims, that's not new to the Americas. They were here long, long ago. The first thing we must understand is that ancient America was not isolated from the old world. As many anthropologists and historians would have us believe. In Mexico and parts of Central and South America, peoples from the old and new world mingled and exchanged ideas before Columbus got information on the Americas from the Muslims in North and West Africa. Evidence leading to the presence of Muslims in ancient America comes from a past of sculptures, oral traditions, eyewitness reports, artifacts, and inscriptions. In Mesoamerican art, we see Africans and Semites in positions of power, prestige, especially in trading communities in Mexico. When, you, when they uh, talk about Semites, this is really silly. When they talk about Semites, Semites is just, Semites is just a brother with a beard. I, as you can see, back in the 70s and 80s, I wore a beard. Now I don't. I'm a clean-shaven man. But so as you can see in a sense is that, that the difference between an African and a Semite was that Africans were, uh, were beardless, whereas Semi Semitic Blacks, they wore a beard. Islam has a long history in the United States. The first Muslims in the United States were the Moors. The Iberian Moors have been trading with Aboriginal FBA for hundreds of years. It was from the Moors that the Spanish and Portuguese learned about the New World. It was due to this trade that Spanish explorers took Moors with them as interpreters. Yes, yes. If you remember, Estebanico, other, other, uh, other uh, Black uh, interpreters, you know, were with just about every group of Spanish explorers. And the reason they had these interpreters is, that, is because of the fact that many people, because of the long history of trade and maybe the migration of, uh, of Muslim and Hebrew people to North America, just about every Indian tribe, you could find somebody in that, in that tribe that either spoke Arabic or Hebrew, or they had someone who was familiar with that language because of this constant history of trade. It wasn't something new. There were many Moors in North America. Here you can see some Canadian... Canadian Muslims, these are some of the uh, very Canadian Moors, rather. If you look on the right hand side, you can see pictures of some of the Moors that lived up in uh, in Canada and in, and in New York. And then you can see the Muslims that lived down in, uh, in, in, in Georgia and in Florida. Yes, the Canadian Yamasis, these were all Muslims, all practicing Islam. The Moors were great seafarers. They used ships to settle many parts of Europe and America. Given the strong presence of Moors in the United States and Canada when Europeans arrived in America, they must have had a strong presence in North America. Yes, yes, a strong presence. These Moors came to America both from Spain and Britain. Some of these Moors were Vikings. Yes, yes. The most well-known navigators of Europe were the Vikings. And the original Vikings, they were not blonde hair. They were not, they were not tall white guys. The original Vikings were Moors. Moors, I tell you, but you've been taught a lie. But we're going to get rid of that lie today. Mark Washington is an F a foundational Black American from Philadelphia. He now lives in Hungary with his family. He made beautiful historical summaries of the history of Blacks around the world that he published on the Golden Age of African Civilization, 2000 BC to 1500 AD website, you know, back in the day. In 2006, he made a, a an historical summary about the Vikings. And uh, this is, uh, this is the, um, the summary that he made up. And uh, you can check this out at his uh, website, Golden Age of African Civilizations. And this, he, 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 he produced these pictures, you know. He showed some of the boats that were used in Africa. He showed, in a sense, the Arctic, where these people lived. And also, in a sense, he, he had pictures to show how, how, how the various headbands that were worn by people in Africa, worn by, by the Egyptians, was also worn in, for, in photograph six by, in a sense, the people who used to live in the Arctic. Yes, these were dark-skinned people. They were black, many of them, in a sense, they mixed with some of the original Eskimos that lived there. And so now you can see some of those features, but you can still see this uh, heritage that they, that they inherited from the uh, Moors that used to live in this area. 
Here we can see some other pictures of people in Sweden. We can see a boat number eight that that shows us, in a sense, some of the uh, the people who were who were among the Vikings who were who were you know taking over these various lands because Viking just mean Viking just means pirate. And then in number ten, we can see you know a woman from Greenland, and we can see, in a sense, that Africanness. We can see that blackness, and uh, because of the fact, in a sense, is that that's who they descended from. You see. The Vikings or the original Danes were blacks. Yes, yes. The Danes or Vikings were blacks. They were Moorish navigators. The Moors are best known for their conquest and rule of the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain and Portugal from the 8th to the 15th centuries. However, they did not conquer the entirety of Europe, but over time they became the Danes. Yes, yes. They uh, they try to teach you that the, that the original Danes were Germanic people, you know, Russian people. No, the original Danes, they were Moors. See, they were the ones that had this, this, this ability to sell ships and make boats. The original Danes were Moors. The original seafaring Danes were Moors. Some of these Moors mixed with Germanic-speaking people inhabiting Denmark and parts of Scandi Scandinavia. These Moors played a significant role in European history particularly during the Viking Age, when they conducted raids, trade, and exploration across Europe and beyond. The Danes had distinctive Moorish cultural and ethnic identity throughout their history. Yes, yes, they were the ones who made these boats. They were the ones who were conquering these cities. They were the ones who were spreading civilization, you see. But they don't tell you that they were Moors. They tell you a lie. They tell you that they were some gigantic German people with these grand muscles and blonde hair. No, they were not. They were Moors. Here's a good example of it. This is from the Norway sledge carving. This is made clear in the Osenberg 8th century Vikings depicted on the Norway sledge carving. Here we see the original Vikings, the black seafarers that populated the Danish region at this time. It is clear from this carving that the 8th century Vikings were different from the blonde, big-bodied folk of Viking legend. Look at there. You can look at them. Look at them. They, they depicted themselves. Look at the long chins. Look at the Negroid features. They're riding horses. But these, in a sense, these were your Danes. These people were your Vikings. They weren't white. They weren't Caucasian. They didn't have blonde hair. You see, the Norway sledge carving is a remarkable archaeological find that sheds light on the artistic and cultural practices of ancient Scandinavia. Dating back to the Viking Age, specifically around the 9th century, this intricate carving was discovered in 1952 through an excavation at the Osenberg Memorial Mound in Norway. This artifact not only serves as a testament to the rich cultural heritage of the Norse Moors people, but also provides valuable insight to their beliefs, rituals, and worldview. Yes, yes, look again. As I said, you can look at these images. They're not of any Caucasians. See? But you wouldn't know this unless you did the original research. But as I told you before, we fail often to do the original research. We just take whatever the European tells us, that this or that is history, this or that was that group, when in reality, much of what they're teaching us is a lie. You have to check it out th themselves. Carp, had to check it out yourself. Stop listening to all these Europeans. Some of what they teach is, is, is true. Some of they, what they teach is, is, is teaching you new knowledge. And, and I'm not going to say that everybody is racist, that everybody is anti-Black, but much of the literature written by Europeans about Europe, about Africa, about the world has been distorted. And the reason it's distorted is because of white supremacy in which they want to maintain that all the, 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 the ancient people, all, 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 all the civilizations were done by Europeans. Second frequency, and that's a lie. Carved from a single piece of oak wood, the sledge features elaborate designs depicting scenes from Norse mythology, including figures such as Odin, the god Odin, and Thor and Loki, as well as animals and geometric patterns. The craftsmanship exhibited in the Norway sledge carving demonstrates the skill and, art and artistry of Viking artisans, showcasing their ability to intricately carve wood with precision and detail. Yes, 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 yes. These gods that you've been taught are supposed to represent Caucasians. They didn't represent Caucasians, you see. 
Look over there on that right-hand side. That's how Thor really looked. That's how Thor looked with his hammer. Look at that power. Look at that intensity. You see, he was a Moor, a black man. Here's some illustrations of, of various Vikings. You can see uh, you can see a Byzantine uh, picture on the uh, left hand side. Then we can see a boat. This is a boat from the from the from uh, the Indian Ocean. But again, you can see some of the uh, the Moors. And then we can see in the final picture on the right hand side, up at the top, we see the uh, when the Moors when the Moors left uh, left left Spain. Now I want you to look at that architecture. You see, look at that building that the Moors left. In this, in the background of these Moors as they're living, uh, leaving Iberia, you see. Uh, below that, and uh, right on the right hand side, we can see a picture of the Casa del de Rey Moro Ronda, and this is in Spain. Look at this. This this shows that the Moors. You know, we we've been conditioned to believe that every all the architecture of Europe, everything came from white folks. But as you can see, this Casa del Rey del Rey Moro. It shows that this is a multi-story. This is a multi-story building. You see? It had up to maybe four or five floors. And yet the Moors built this. Yes, people like you, people like me, people like us. You see? But they've conditioned you to believe that, that the only thing that black people can build are, are some huts. But look at this rich architecture. And these Moors, they came from where? They came from Senegal. They talk about North Africa, but, but most of the Moors that, that went to uh, Africa, went to uh, Spain, I mean, Iberia, they uh, came the, from the madrasas. Those are, uh, those are schools. They came from the madrasas in Senegal, you see, in 7-Eleven. But think about the architectural styles. They tell our children every day, you can't be an architect. You're black. You can't be a doctor. You're black. Black people don't do anything except fight, kill, shoot each other in Chicago and other cities around the nation. But they're lying. They're lying. You know, the Moors are a good example of, 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 of the creativity, of the excellence of black people. And these were black people. These were not second frequency. They were not Caucasians. The Vikings early invaded Britannia and, and later made their way to North America. The expansion of the Moors into Britain played a significant role in shaping the history and culture of the British Isles during the Viking Age. Spanning roughly from the 8th century to the mid-11th century, Danish Vikings, often referred to as Danes, were among the North seafarers who ventured beyond their homelands in search of wealth, land, and adventure. Their incursions into Britain began with raids on coastal communities but eventually evolved into large-scale invasions and settlements. Yes, yes. Initially, the Moorish Danish raids on Britain were sporadic and primarily ta targeted monasteries and wealthy coastal towns. These raids intensified during the late 8th and early 9th century with notable attacks on locations such as Lindisfarne and Jaro. These incursions not only brought plunder and destruction, but also instilled fear among the local populace. However, as the Danes became more familiar with the British coastline and its vulnerabilities, their raids grew bolder and more organized, leading to the establishment of winter camps and fortified bases. Here you can see, a, look at this. Here's a picture of some Vikings. You know, this is some of the Norsemen. Look at them. You can see these black people. Yes, they depicted these black people. They didn't depict them as white people. The descendants of the Black Vikings often have Black or Black Black Germain in surnames. The, Vi the Vikings left the Anglo-Saxon names Blachimain, Bergy, Blachimain stone on the Kittish coast, and Blachimain stone on the Norse coast. In the Doomsday Survey, yes, this is a, a, a book written in, over there in, uh, in Britain. In the Doomsday Survey, there's mention of Black people in Buckinghamshire, Blachimain, Swartinus, Sussex, and Black Blackmanus, and Swartigus and Suffolk. Yes, yes, yes. There was all these black folk, and, and these names. These names go back to, in a sense, these 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 Vikings. You know, these swarthy people. In fact, that's where the name swarthy comes from, or the black people. The black Vikings settled Ireland in 795 AD, AD, and established the Black Norse Kingdom of Dublin 
which was found in 839 AD. Again, here's another uh, close-up picture of the boat, and you can see these Vikings. Look at the look at those brown skins. See, they're not Caucasian. These Vikings aren't Caucasian. These are Danish. These were Moors. Stop. Stop. Stop believing everything you've been taught. That's a lie. The Vikings who invaded Ireland were blacks. The black Vikings were called Dubaginti, or black Gentiles. In some texts, according to Thomas William Shore, an origin of the Anglo-Saxon race, is reported that a large number of black Vikings settled Dublin in 1851. Again, here's a close-up. Just take a minute to look at these Vikings. You know, what, what makes what makes this uh, picture of the Vikings so interesting, I mean, many of you might might see uh, a resemblance of some of your cousins, your uncles, you know? Maybe your father or your brother. These were the Duba, Gwinti. Duba, that means black, see? Again, this is the uh, this is the full picture, and you and we've already seen that close up of of the people of these uh, Vikings. You see, in eight fifty two, the black Gentiles were attacked by the Finn Ginty, who arrived in eight ships. The Finn Ginty, these were our second frequency. They were defe defeated after three days by the Dub Ginty. After three days of battle, these blacks controlled the Irish coast. Yes, they controlled the Irish coast from. For much of the ninth century, from that center in Dublin, Dublin that means, in a sense, the Black Land. Yes, yes, these Black Vikings were ruling in Ireland. You see, the Moors' expansion into Britain reached its apex with the establishment of the Dane Law, a region in eastern and northern England where Danish law and customs held sway. This period saw a blending of Anglo-Saxon and Danish culture as well as intense political rivalry and conflict between Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and Danish warlords. The eventual unification of England under King, King Estiostan in the early 10th century brought about a degree of stability, but Danish influence persisted in Britain for centuries, leaving a lasting impact on its language, institution, and societal norms. Yes, yes, yes. Stop, stop. It's time you stop thinking about the Vikings being some some muscular blonde people. If there was any muscular people, I already showed you that they were black, like you, black, like me, black, like us. Abu Bakari Marley, he's an uh, he's a, a interesting figure because I believe in a sense that 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 many Moors or Muslims came with uh, Abu Bakari in 1300s. Many Malians sailed to the Americas. The Malians probably learned about America from the Moors. Yes, yes, yes. Although most Malians settled in Brazil, Mexico, and built the mounds along the Mississippi River, some Malians settled in Florida. Here they may have influenced the Yamasi, and, and I already showed you how they, how many of the Yamasis were, were wearing turbans, they were in kufi, cats, things, kufi hats and things like that. Around 25,000 Mandy speakers set sail for America in the 1300s from the Mali Empire of West Africa. Some of these Mandy speakers may have been ancestors of the Nanakoke. Yes, yes, that is a, a, a group of aboriginals that lived in, the, uh, in New England, the Nanakoke. The expeditionary force of Manzab of Bukhari must have been immense because the average boat on the Niger in the 1500s AD could carry 80 men. That means... That means that anywhere between 25,000 to 80,000 men and women, possibly, may have sailed from Mali along with Mansa Abu Bakari. The mention of a violent, you know, the Arabs, they recorded this, uh, they recorded this trip of uh, Abu Bakari from Mali into the Atlantic Ocean. And the reason they recorded this, uh, this, this trip of Abu Bakari by, uh, by the Arab authors is that the uh, the king that came after Abu Bakari was Mansa Musa. And Mansa Musa was the richest man that ever existed, they claim, and that he took so much gold to Egypt on his way to, to perform the Hajj, which was the pilgrimage to Mecca, that he brought down the uh, price of uh, gold. So this shows, in a sense, the uh, the reality of the uh, richness of the uh, Mali Empire, and it could explain how, how Abu Bakari, given the richness of the Mali Empire, 
Mali rulers, was able to amass such a group, 25 to 80,000 people, to go with him, you know. We can hypothesize that Abu Bakari and his expeditionary force probably left the city of Niani by canoe and traveled down the river to the Gulf of Guinea. From here, the expeditionary force was probably carried by the, the Guinea current out into the Atlantic, where it met the South Equatorial current. The South Equatorial current carried the Mali explorers to Brazil and probably also Mexico. Murphy, he uh, did some research on the uh, on the uh, Malian Empire back in the uh, in the uh, 1960s and 70s. Murphy reported that the Malian military wore uniform consisting of sandals, loose-fitting cotton breeches, reaching down to the knees, a sleeveless tonic, and a white headdress of either cotton or leather, decorate, decorate one, of, one or more feathers. The major weapon of the Malian soldier included iron-pointed spears, daggers, and short swords. Wooden, bo wooden battle clubs and the bow and arrow. You know this is interesting because here we see here we see some pictures of some um, of some of the Americans, the Aboriginal Americans. On the uh, left hand side, we we have an artifact that came from Brazil. And on the right hand side, we found uh, we we see a figure from the spiral the spiral mounds. As you can see, the Malian royal from Brazil wears a sleeveless tunic. Note, take a look. Skull cap breeches reaching down to the knees, as described by Europeans who visited the Mali Empire. Yes, and then we find in the spiral mound figure, and this was a this was a figure that that they found in one of the mounds. He also wears a skull cap and breeches. He also had a shield on his back. This is interesting because Malian Marines usually were armed with a leather shield and short sword. The spiral the spiral mound figure may be a representation of a Malian Marine. And so as we can see, that, that Abu Bakari, his, uh, marine, his marine units seem to have influenced much of the dress of many uh, peoples in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Americas, you see. The Malians left many inscriptions in Brazil and elsewhere after they arrived in the Americas. These inscriptions are of two kinds. One group of inscriptions, inscriptions were meant to warn the Mandi expeditionary force not to camp, camp in certain areas. You can see, uh, you can see uh, inscriptions from Bruce Hill, Bayfield, Massachusetts, um, you know, from Oklahoma, and you can see some also from Brazil. So, so we know that these these uh, Malians were all over, all over the, uh, all over the United States. That's one of the reasons that we find so much influence among these people, and uh, one of the reasons that we uh, that we know that they had a great influence here. You see. So we find, in a sense, that we not only have the uniform that was worn by many of the Malian Marines, we also have these inscriptions that let us know that there were Moors. Yes, there were Moors here, Muslims here, before the Americans came. In, in Brazil, the uh, Portuguese even discovered many inscriptions. They even discovered, in a sense, you know, a temple. And in this temple, or uh, this, uh, this temple, they found these inscriptions that were definitely Malian in origin, you know. The Portuguese found evidence of the Malian elites, and, and this is an elite. And, uh, you know, this is a Mandingo no, noble. And on his chest, we see inscriptions. These inscriptions are written in the Vi, and they discuss the fact that he was a ruler of Mali. He was a ruler in Brazil, that he was the leader of the community, and that he was buried in a buried in a tomb, you know. And so it's very important to understand is that, as, as I try to tell the family, is that Black people have always been a literate culture. They they try to teach you today that black people do not like to write. We've never had any languages. All we like to do is have oral tradition. That's a lie. You know, black and African people have always have always been literate. They've always had writing systems. They've always, in a sense, been laying down their their history, aspects of their culture to tell us, but they usually inscribe these messages in stone. They left these messages in stone not just for me, but they left them for you. They left them for us. We have to, in a sense, try to study them. Uh, Ishan Thor, uh, in a in an article called Muslim Discovered Before Columbus, you know, he led uh, the uh, king of uh, Turkey, Erdogan. He's the uh, present president. You know, and, uh, and so Erdogan, he claimed a few years ago, you know, that uh, Columbus saw a mosque in Cuba. You know, Thor wrote in a paper, in a 1996 paper, Imrek referred to the presence of a mosque body by Columbus along the Cuban coast. 
Columbus admitted in his papers that on Monday, October 21st, 1492, the Christian era, while his ship was sailing near Gibara on the northeast coast of Cuba, he saw a mosque on top of a beautiful mountain. This is not, this is not, this is incorrect. Columbus did not say that he saw a mosque. This is why you have to, in a sense, read. You have to read. I haven't seen the Spanish document. This may, this is only uh, the English translation, and it may, in a sense, be a translation just to lead us down, you know, a road. And maybe Columbus did see, did see, in a sense, a mosque there. But in the English translation of this uh, of this particular uh, text, this uh, inscription for October twenty first, fourteen ninety two. It really reads like this, according to the uh, translation. Remarking on the position of the river and port to which he gave the name of San Salvador, he, Columbus, describes his mountains as lofty and beautiful, like the Pina de la and the Moradas, and one of them has another little hill on the summit, like a graceful mosque. The other river and port in which he now was has two round mountains to the southwest and a fine low cape running out in the west-southwest. So again, in a sense, they say he didn't see a mosque, but he did, in a sense, describe the area as looking like a mosque. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, I'd have to see the Spanish, the the original Spanish inscription. I haven't, uh, I haven't, uh, you know, really researched it. But this is very interesting, you know. But we do know in a sense, we do know something more. We know that Cortez did see mosques. Yes, Cortez, Cortez did see mosques. The Aztecs were not native to Mexico. Montezuma told Cortez that, and I quote, we have known for a long time from the chronicles of our forefathers that neither I nor those who inhabit this country are descendants from the aborigines of it, but from strangers who came to it from very distant parts, as we also hold that our race was brought to these parts by a lord whose vessels they all were and who returned to his native country. After a long time, he came back. But it was so long that those who remained here were married with the native women of the country and had many descendants and had been built towns where they were living. When therefore he wished to take them away with him, they would not go, nor still less receive him as their ruler. So he departed. Again, in a sense, this is what Montezuma told the Spanish. And 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 and, and we have, in a sense, we have the, the, the documentation that Abu Bakari did, in a sense, he, he, sent, he sent an earlier trip to the Americas, and it was a while before they came back, before he left with 25,000. He already sent out a couple hundred ships, even before even before, even before his uh, his uh, main trip around 13, 13, 13, 13, 10, but he had sent out another trip earlier. So we can see that this corresponds to what? This corresponds to Abu, Abu Bakari's, uh, you know, migration or, or expeditionary force that came to the Americas, you know. The Aztecs were Muslims. Yes, they were Muslims because they had many mosques. Cortez wrote that, and I quote, This great city contains many mosques or houses for idols, very beautiful edifices situated in the different precepts of it, the principal ones of which are the religious orders of their sect, for whom, besides the houses in which they keep their idols, there are very good habitations provided. All these priests dress in black and never cut or comb their hair, from the time they enter the religious order until they leave it, and the sons of all the principal families. Both of chiefs as well as noble citizens are in these religious orders and habits from the age of seven or eight years till they are taken away for the purpose of marriage. This happens more frequently with the firstborn who inherit the property than with the others. They have no access to women, nor are they allowed to enter the religious houses. They abstain from eating certain dishes, and more so at certain times of the year than at others. This material, this material that I'm reading on the Islamic culture of the Aztecs, it comes from Letters of Cortez to Emperor Charles V, Volume 1, Second Letter, October 30th, 1520. Now you can see some actual, you see an actual condes, condex. And in this, you can see how, how they, how the pictures, these are the pictures, actual pictures of the Aztecs. And, you know, here we see an Aztec, Who's about to uh, who's about to torture some of the uh, red Indians? You see, because the red Indians, they were very jealous of the uh, black Aztecs, and because they were je jealous of the of the uh, of the uh, Aztecs, then the Aztecs were engaged in many wars with these red Indians. You know, a lot of times people believe that the Aztecs were so were so mean 
because the Aztecs were always sacrificing these people. They were always fighting them, but that was because of the fact they were fighting them. And you had to remember that 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 the Islam that was practiced by Muslims in ancient Mali around 1300 is different from the Islam that that we see in West Africa today. Because many of many there's been many so-called Islamic jihads in West Africa, and as in a sense they were it was these Islamic jihads. These Islamic jihads they made they made the Islamic practices of people in West Africa more in conformity to the uh, practices of Islam, maybe in Saudi Arabia, some of the practices. But but we would but in the earlier Islam practiced by the Muslims before the jihads of the 1800s or the late 1700s, it would have been in a sense uh, Islamic practices that would have that would have been ideally suited to the Aztec people. But let's continue. The Aztecs mosques. The Spanish wrote, and I and I quote: Among these mosques, there is one principal one, and no human tongue is able to describe its greatness and details, because it is so large that within its circuit, which is surrounded by a high wall, a village of five hundred houses could easily be built. Within and all around it are very handsome buildings in which there are large rooms and galleries where the religious who live there are lodged. There are so many as 40 very high and well-built towers, the largest having 50 steps to reach the top. The principal one is higher than the tower of the chief church in Seville. Look at this. This is how they, this is how, you know, an artist's interpretation of how, how the, uh, how Montezuma's uh, capital city would have looked. You see, it had pyramids. It had these things. See, we, we take for granted and say, no, no, how, how did they get these pyramids from Africa? It's because they were building these pyramids in Africa. Yes, they built many of these tombs over their things. Yeah, you know, and, and so it's very important to understand is that is that that they did build these mosques and that these mosques represented. In the letter of Cortes, the emperor of Charles V, by one second, you know, they they we read further. They Aztec mosques are well built both in their masonry and in their woodwork that they could not be better made nor constructed anywhere for all the masonry inside the chapels where they keep their idols, it's carved with figures, and the woodwork is all wrought with designs of monsters and other shapes. All these towers are places of burial for the chiefs, and each one of their chapels is dedicated to the idol to which they have a particular devotion. Within the great mosque, there are three halls wherein stand the principal idols of Marius grandeur, grandeur in size and much decorated with carved figures, both of stone and wood. And within these halls, there are other chapels entered by very small doors and which have no light and notably, but the religious are admitted to them. Within these are the images and figures of the idols. Although, as I have said, there are many outsides. Very important, as I told you before, is that the Islamic practices, these would have been Islamic practices practiced by people in Africa before the jihads, because the jihads, Led by people such as Usman Dan Fodio and others, they brought a more they brought a more standardized Islamic practice to West Africa. But this would have been how Islam would have been practiced around 1300 when uh, people had left Mali. You see, Cortez' description of the Aztec religion shows that it reflected the Islamic practices by Malian Muslims during the days of Mansa Abu Bakari. It also describes pyramidal structures the man to use to bury their leaders. Here we can see an uh, Aztec pyramid, and then we can see, in a sense, the uh, the tomb of uh, the tomb of Askia Muhammad. You see, look at that. Look at that picture of the tomb. Look at look at that building and where Askia at tomb Askia Muhammad was buried under there. It looks exactly almost like the pyramids, you know, you know that they that formerly existed among the Aztecs. Look at those buildings, you know, around you know at, around the base of the pyramid. These, in a sense, show. Their, their African uh, character. And it also, in a sense, is that when we look back at, at these pictures and we see these similar buildings, right? We see similar similar building. And so what we find, in a sense, is that, is, that, is that this culture, this culture that we found in Mexico, these, these pyramids, they would have been the same. They would have been, they were already building pyramids over there in West Africa. The only problem is that 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 those pyramids that they built, that the Aztecs built, they tore them down and they took the brick and they made their own. They made their own, in a sense. 
buildings the Spanish did from the uh, from the Aztec pyramids. You see, they used them for quarries, just like they used the uh, Black Aboriginals uh, uh, pyramids in North America as quarries, place where they could get stone. There were moors, there were moors, moors, or moors in the American Carolinas also. They wore similar headgear in addition to turbans. These moors may have been part of the Abubakari settlement of America. Again, here we can see the uh, we can see this uh, this uh, idol, this uh, this inscription from Brazil, and you can see the Kufi hat on this uh, on this brother from Brazil, and we see a Kufi hat on it on one of the Yamasi Indians. You can see this. You can see, in a sense, this historical continuity. You see, and there was continuity because. There was this whole idea of an Islamic group of people, and when we when we look at the fact that there was that there were many Muslims and Hebrews in America, you know, before Columbus got here, then you can understand why those Spanish explorers, when they came here, why they had with them Moorish interpreters. They had with them Moorish interpreters because they knew that many of the Aboriginals could speak in a sense Arabic. You know, here's the uh, the Wishonar Nation was not the first Black Native Americans to reclaim their Muslim heritage. Noble Drew Ali, founder of the Moore Scientists, was also part Black Native American. Yes, yes. Noble Drew Ali, he was a foundational Black Aboriginal. See? And you can see from the you can see the tradition was already here. So so a lot of times people people always look, oh, he got it. All these black people, foundational black men, they got it from the Arabs, they got it from somebody over there, ah, the Ahmadis or somebody. No, there was already a tradition here of uh, Black people being Muslim Islam. We find mention of Moors in the oral tradition of Aboriginal Indians in the Northeastern United States. These Moors were depicted as Aboriginals by Europeans. Again, you can see the Canadian and, and the Canadian and New York uh, Moors, and we can compare them to the Yamasi. But one thing we have to understand is this. The term Moor or Moor was used by Europeans to refer to African Muslims. Given this definition, some of the people with Abu Bakari were Muslims. Look at the evidence. You don't see any Indians wearing turbans except among the five civilized tribes, right? The Cherokee had a writing system made by Sequoia. There's a, there's a, we don't know how, here's a picture of, of they made up of Sequoia who invented in a sense the Cherokee script. But the Cherokee script is nothing but Mandy and by writing, you see? The, the Amasi has soldiers wearing turbans and kufi hats. In addition to some Choctaw and Cherokee wore turbans. Yes, yes, yes. You, you know, you, you see these people and they're wearing turbans. Why? And you see this color red. Very interesting. You know, we brought that up. Uh, if you look, if you look at the uh, American maroon, you know, we brought that up that many of the uh, many of the uh, the Ab Aboriginal people, you know, usually had a uh, do rag, and and often these do rags were red or mixed with red and other colors. But again, you can see that the Cherokee, Choctaw, and other uh, members of the uh, of the five civilized tribe were often you know, depicted as wearing turbans, you see? And then when we look at the Yamasi, we see turbans again. Look at that brother behind the uh, brother with the kufi hat, you see? So the logical infer inference is that what? They were Muslims. We had to believe that. But you know, a very interesting thing is that the Nanticoke, the, man the Nanticoke, there are people that lived in, the, uh, in New England. They have two oral traditions. The first tradition is that they formerly lived in central United States and migrated eastward 300 years ago before the coming of the European to avoid incessant warfare. The interesting thing about this tradition is that it would place their origin in where? Central U.S., Central United States. And this would, and 300 years ago, would put them in a sense around the time of Abu, Abu Bakari sailed to the Americas. Okay, you can find, you can find these traditions in the Indians of East Shore of, the, of Maryland by F.G. F. G. Speck, you see? And this was uh, printed in, uh, in 1922, and it records uh, the traditions of the nanny coat. Uh, there's a uh, picture. The picture on the left-hand side shows one of the leaders of the nanny coat uh, people. You know, you can see that they that they wore the uh, sash. You know, uh, and then there's the, there's the left collar. It's always usually over the, uh, the uh, it's always usually over, it looks like the right shoulder, and then they would pin it and stuff like that. Okay, the Nanticoke made it clear that they are Moors. The Nanticoke have two oral traditions, you see. And the first, as I said earlier, is that form they lived in the central United States and migrated eastward 300 years before the coming of the Europeans to avoid incessant warfare. 
Another Nanticoke tradition traces their descent to Moorish sailors who were shipwrecked on the Maryland sea coast. Okay, this is very interesting because here we see, in a sense, you know the the uh, you know this guy named this guy named Prelius. He collected he collected in a sense the the numerals the numbers of the Nanticoke. And when you look at these numbers of the nanocoat, the uh, numbers, you find in a sense that many of these numbers relate to uh, the Mandingo language. For example, number one was Kili, and Mandingo is Kilin. The, the number for two is Philly, and Mandingo is Fula. The number three is Sapo, and, uh, and Mandinga is Saba. And the number for four is Nano, and it's Nani. So again, in a sense, we see that 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 look at this. Look at this. We see that the Nanticoke, who said that they are descendants of, of in a sense, you know, uh, Moors, you know, that they had, that the numerals, the numbers that they used related to who? The Mandy people. And we know the people of Malay, led by Abu Bakari, they, in a sense, they would have spoke the Mandy language. On page 10, we read in, in the, in the, uh, the, the uh, text that I mentioned earlier, on page 10, this is what we read. The present-day Nanticoke and Delaware form self-recognized communities with their own schools and churches and possess a decidedly endogamous tendency, which refused particularly to recognize marriage with Negroes. Oh, they're black, but they don't want to be Negroes. They don't want to be black, you know. But they style, now listen to this. They style themselves variously as Nanticoke Moors, Moors. And Indians, yes, yes, yes. Do you see it? Do you see it? The Moors, the Moors, they have a very long tradition in the United States. You see, many people teach that the Moors only came from Morocco. We said there was already Moors here, and the Moors didn't have to come from no damn Morocco. This is why I do research. This is why I teach a research course. And in my research course, I teach my students how to do research so they can interpret literature. They can interpret, you know, artifacts, writings, and things like that so they can find the truth. You see, a very interesting thing is that, um, you know, they found some Roman coins in New England. You may say, what do Roman coins have to do with the Moors? I'm going to explain to you. Cyrus H. Gordon in Before Columbus, Links Between the Old World and Ancient America. Gordon wrote, and I quote, Nearly all, the, nearly all the coins of Roman from the reign of Augustus to the fourth century of the Christian era, era. Two of the coins, however, are Arabic from the eighth century Christian era. It is the latter that gives us the terminus a quo, a time after which, of the collection as a whole, which cannot be earlier than the latest coins in the collection. Roman coins continue to be used as currency into medieval times. Yes, yes. They, they, this Arabic coin, they were found down in, in, you know, in South America. But they let you know, in a sense, that, hey, that, that, that during the Moorish period, they, had, they used Roman coins. So if you find Roman coins in the Northeast, this may be an indicator of these Moors who, who we know that, in a sense, became shipwrecked, you know, in New England. But let's read this. The fact that the Moors use Roman coins is interesting, given the fact that Roman coins have been found near the northeastern coast, where Nanticoke traditions tell us, of, tell us of a Moor shipwreck. The discovery of these Roman coins discussed by Epstein may indicate that they go back to the entry of Nanticoke Moors in the northeastern United States and are not associated with post-Columbian events. They always try to say that these, that these Roman coins, they may, in a sense, have arrived in America after, after, in a, after, you know, the, uh, after, you know, maybe Moors or, or, or Muslims were here. But now we, given the fact that we have an oral tradition, we have an oral tradition of the Nanako that, that claims that they were Moors who were shipwrecked. Not only that, we have, in a sense, a list of the numerals and numbers used by the Nanako, which were Mandy names. And now we have these, we have evidence of these various Roman coins that's been that's been found in Northeast United States. All of these things point to who? It points to many Moors being of, in a sense, of, 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 of Mandy origin, many Moors who may have been with Abu Bakari when he came to the United States. You have to look at collateral evidence. 
We have three evidences of this, a nanocoat oral tradition, nanocoat numbers, and Roman coins. Yes, yes, yes. We don't have to. See, the European, the second frequency, they're going to tell you in a sense that, oh, there were no black people in America. No, black people came over as slaves. No, and if there were more, these Moors came. with Columbus and the Spanish. But here we have evidence that the Moors were already here. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Listen to these lies. Evidence leading to the presence of Muslims in ancient America comes from a password sculpture, oral traditions, eyewitness reports, artifacts, and inscriptions. In Mesoamerican art, we see African in the position of power and prestige, especially in trading communities of Mexico. From the evidence available, it seems that the Muslim navigators arrived in the New World from Africa and Spain. This is supported by the Arab coins found off the coast of South America dating back to 800 AD, as, as discussed by C. George, C. Gordon and before Columbus. These, co these coins lend validity to al Masud's claim that Muslims of Cordoba reached the New World in, in Maruj Adadahab. Ad written in the year 956. Masudi said, in the ocean of fog, the Atlantic Ocean, here are many curiosities, which we have mentioned in detail in Akbar, Akbari Zam, Zamari, alas, now lost. Adventures, adventurers who penetrated it on the risk of their lives, some returning safely, others perishing in the attempt. Yes, yes, yes. This, 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 uh, this, this tradition, recorded by al Masudi, you see? It correlates to talk about people who, 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 who in a sense, their, their ships their ships wrecked in the Americas and they were left here. Now we know what happened to many of them. They joined the Nanako, or they became, in a sense, the Nanako, Aboriginal people, see? But the Nanako today, they don't, don't call me black, me no black, me no black, me no black, me Aboriginal. But if you're more, you must be black. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop running away. In the early period of the slave trade, Muslims in America came from the Berber, the Fula, the Mandi speaking, and Wolof tribes in West Africa. Hausa, Fulani, and Yoruba peoples would represent the latter or the Sudanic Muslim groups that lived in the New World. During the reign of Ferdinand the Catholic, the African and Asian Muslims from Spain openly identified themselves with Islam in the Caribbean. But owing to his liberalism, Ferdinand was relieved of his duties by Cardinal Cisnestes in, in Madrid on 22nd July, 1517. His powers were then delegated to the bishops of Santa Maria of the islands of Santo Domingo and Constantine. J.T. Medina notes that Ferdinand was, was relieved of his duties due to Hebrews and Muslims openly practicing their rites, teachings, and ceremonies, you see which were offensive to our Christian religion and evangelical law and grave scandal to Christian believers. Yes, yes, yes. See, as, as I told you, see, that's why if you take my research course, you learn how to do research, see? You learn how to do research. You don't just take things from the surface. You try to go to the sources. At first, to restore the development of an Islamic empire in the New World, Spanish authorities demanded the importation teaching of Ladinos, Spanish-speaking Christian slaves rather than Bazalis, or raw slaves direct from Africa, to make sure they contain Islam in Africa. The demand for, for slaves was, however, so great that even Muslim slaves were taken to the New World. But by 1539, the king decreed that the sons and grandsons of persons burned at the stake of Muslim origin or Moors converted to Islam, the Moriscos, to Christianity were not permitted to in the Caribbean, owing to their conversion of other peoples to Islam in this area. And in 1543, Charles V ratified the decree and ordered the expulsion of the Muslims who had already settled in the Americas. By 1550, the slaves of Majorca, Menorca, and Sardinia, Sardinia, and almost all the slaves from the Levant and Guinea, who were suspected of being Muslims, even though they had had first been taken to New Spain in 1505, were not permitted there anymore. Yet, due to the excessive demand for slave labor and the myth of Ham's curse and the reality of the Islam's presence in Africa, 
few questions were asked about the origin of most slaves. To avoid the well-known the well-known Muslim areas of Africa or places where Muslim slaves were sold, by 1550, the Spanish began to import slaves from the Guinea coast. But even these measures failed to keep Islam from spreading among the Indians who worked alongside African Muslims. This is evident from the letter of Enrique sent to King of Spain, which indicates that even Muslims from the Philippines, yes, yes, Muslims from the Philippines con converted Indians to Islam. And that by the late, late 16th century, there were a large number of Muslims who were Indians. As a result of the Berber and Morisco's preaching of Islam in 1578, they were again barred from coming to Mexico. Although all the Mandingos were non-Muslims, a considerable number were, though. Some Mandingo Man Manding Muslims were taken to America. There were always a minority among the slaves taken there because the American slavers usually avoided the most popular slave markets for markets in Angola, the Congo, and as far away as East Africa in search of cheap slaves. <coughs> Information on the Mexican Inquisition is found in the, in the Procedos de Indias and other subsidiary documents from Inquisition archives. Greenleaf noted that, and I quote, <coughs> excuse me, the Holy Office of the Inquisition in colonial Mexico had as its purpose the defense of Spanish religion and Spanish Catholic culture against individuals who held heretical views and people who, who showed lack of respect for religious principles. J.T. Medina says that he was relieved because under him adherence to the religion of Moses and Muhammad for holding their rites, teachings and ceremonies openly under the eyes of Christians. The Mexican Inquisition had jurisdiction over baptized Catholics, Africans and Europeans, enslaved or free, and non-Christian indigenous people. Yes, yes, they were serious. They were serious. They were going to do everything they could to make sure that they would not have another Muslim empire in the Americas. The Spanish believed they had crushed Islam in America with the destruction of the Aztec nation. Yes, yes, they thought it. But there were still people dua, making dua at the pyramids. But many of the earliest slave revolts, the jihads in the Americas, even when they involved both Africans and Indians, were led by Muslims from Senegal. In 1531, the Spanish declared that the Wolof were haughty and disobedient. Yes, yes, yes. These Wolof, they were they were performing dua. They were performing devotion to 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 Allah, to their to God, because they believed, you see, in Islam. By the beginning of the 17th century, and especially the 18th century, the slavers began moving their slave operation further south into the Mandi speaking areas of West Africa. This led to the introduction of Muslims into the United States. The Wolof have very great, strong ancestral roots here. There were many, many Wolof in the Americas. The Wolof are very dark-skinned Black people who Murdoch includes in the group of Senegambians. At present, the Wolof are mainly found in the coastal part of Senegal, although they originally extended further north into Mauritania. Practically no data are available on the origin of the Wolof. According to Wolof tradition, their ancestors migrated from Sahara Desert into the, re into the region north of Senegal, Fudatoro. But around AD 1000, they were forced to move further south, pressed by the Berbers from the north and by the Pool Fulani from the east. According to the late Sheikh Anta Giap, the great Senegambian Senegalese historian and anthropologist, the main groups of people in Senegambia had their origins in ancient Egypt. To support this theory, Diop throw, draws on a number of disciplines from archaeology to linguistics and a variety of sources from African oral tradition to the writings of the Greeks and Arab. You know, Wolof in America had a very tremendous impact on, on uh, the uh, people in, uh, in North America. The Wolofs were brought to North American colonies as enslaved people between 1670 and 1700. Working principally as house slaves, they may they may have been in the first Africans whose cultural elements and language were assimilated into the developing culture of America. They would have also been uh, working on tobacco fields, you know, because tobacco was tobacco was an, an, an important source of income for many of the uh, people living in the American colonies. And so you would have found many, uh, many of these, uh, these Muslims, you know, working on the uh, plant, tobacco plantations. 
Even though the Spanish created a whole body of laws and regulations to thwart Muslim infiltration into the Caribbean, Mexico, many Spanish Muslims succeeded in entering, entering the Americas. During the reign of Ferdinand the Catholic, quote, Muslims publicly practiced their religion, but as a result of Ferdinand's liberality, he had to be put out of power and they had to have this inquisition, you see. And it was at these inquisitions that many of these uh, these African Muslims, these were uh, and, and Aboriginal Muslims in Mexico had to be killed. In the 16th century, a major problem the Spanish encountered was the propagation of Islam among the Amerindians. Indians. As a result, the king ordered all of his administrators to try and convert the Indian Muslims to the Catholic faith, a process which they often found bore no results. It should be noted that the Berbers, Wolof, and Mandy were not the only ones who converted Indians to Islam, because as early as 1578, Moriscos, Grenadians, converted to Islam, were not allowed under any circumstance any of them to remain there, Mexico, or their children who may have been born there because they were preaching Islam. And see, because of the fact that that when you first hear about these uh, Wolof being able to uh, convert so many people to Islam, it wasn't so much that they were able to convert these people. As, as I've already pointed out, many of the people in Mexico, like the Aztecs, were already Muslims. They're already Muslims. They're, the Islam that they practiced was, was slightly different, but they but they all believed in a sense, peace of your law, that they were in the service of God. And because they felt that they were in the service of Allah, it was easy for these Muslim, these Muslims who came into uh, Mexico during the slave trade to be able to find many of the uh, aboriginals to uh, to adopt Islam because many of them were familiar with the religion. So this is something that you had to keep in mind. Many of the earliest slave revolts and jihads in the Americas, even when they involved both Africans and Indians, were led by Muslims from Senegal. In 1531, the Spanish declared that the Wolof were haughty and disobedient. And in Suriname, Araby, one of the greatest leaders of the Bush Blacks defeated the Dutch on several occasions and was granted territory under the terms of the peace treaty between the Bush Blacks and the Dutch near French Guyana for his people to live for the rest of their lives. Yes, yes, yes. They did not like Muslim slaves because the authorities claimed they fled to the Indians and taught them bad manners, and they could not be apprehended. In 1518, African Muslims and non-Muslims at the sugar mills of Haiti quit working and fled and fled whenever they could in squads and started rebellions and committed murders. In 1527, Indian and African Muslims rebelled in Florida, you see. And in 1532, the Jolof or Wolof led a, re a rebellion among the Carib Indians. By 1533, the Wolof were prohibited from entering the Indies without special permit. Mandy and Wolof Muslims also staged rebellions in 1546 in Honduras, and in 1537 in Mexico, yes, yes, yes. The Wolof, in a sense, they were about that. They were about that business. They was about that business of being maroons, and they were about that business, in a sense, of, of in a sense, leading, leading these various rebellions against the uh, Spanish, based upon the uh, fact, in a sense, that uh, you know, Islam meant that you should be free. Islam meant that you should fight in the service of God, peace of your law, in the service of God. Muslims in the United States. Moreover, well, the American slave traders specialized in the sale and recruitment of children and teenagers because you could bring more slaves on the slave ship if they were smaller. Also, the price for these slaves was less than for an adult and they could occupy less space and so profits were greater. So again, in a sense, the Americans, they specialized in getting, you know, kind of young people. They wanted to get young people as slaves because they felt in a sense they could make more money and they didn't take up that much room. The Spanish and Portuguese were the primary initiators of the African transatlantic slave trade. Due to the large number of Muslim slaves imported by the Spanish, they decided they should not purchase any more slaves from Northwest Africa, especially Berbers and Wolof. The reason the Spanish and later other European plans refused to import Wolof was due to their rebellious nature and constant practice of the concept of jihad or holy war. Due to the Spanish fear of Islamic contamination, immediate measures were attempted to eliminate the threat of Islam in America, but scattered reports of Muslims and Latin in America continued into the 19th century. From the 16th century onward, 
It is only when the Muslims are punished for practicing their faith or participating in slave revolts, jihads, that we hear of them. For example, there's mention of Luis Salano, a mulatto Muslim, and Lipe, Lipe de la Pina, described as a Moor from Guadalajara, who were, who were convicted by the Holy Office for spreading Islam in Cusco. In 1565, all Wolofs were ordered out of Chile. Yes, yes, yes. This is what we do research for. We do research that we can find out what's going on. We do research that you can find out the actual history. Don't wait for Europeans to tell you stuff. They have the sources, but you have to read it and interpret it. During the, inf the infamous A Atlantic slave trade, thousands of Muslims from the Senegambia and Sudan were kidnapped or captured in local wars and sold into slavery. In America, these were same Muslims converted other Africans and Mary Indians to Islam. Many of these same slaves and their descendants returned to Africa and played various roles in the development of such European colonies as Benin, Dahomey, Togolan, cities in Nigeria, and also Gambia in colonial and pre-colonial times. Although many African and European historians would argue against the Arabic language and Islam playing a significant role in the development of Africans in the diaspora, and maybe in Africa itself, at least among African and Afro-American Muslim communities during, during and shortly after slavery, the fact remains that Arabic and Islam were the major vehicles of exchange among Africans of different ethnic origin in Africa and in the diaspora. This supported by the fact that the majority of the earliest and latest slaves who arrived in the Americas came from the regions where Muslims were in the majority, places which had been seen the penetration of Islam even before the Mali Empire, that's why I was trying to tell you that the Islam that would have been practiced by the Aztecs was definitely different from the Islam that, in a sense, was practiced by Africans after the uh, various uh, jihads, you know, such as uh, the jihad of, uh, of uh, Uthman Dan Fodio. Additionally, a large number of Wolof words took root in American English because Wolof people were frequently used as interpreters by European slavers along the coast of West Africa in the early years of the slave trade. These African interpreters use Wolof names for African foodstuffs fed to enslaved Africans on the Middle Passage, such as yams and bananas, words that have words that then became parts of standard English in North America. You know, here's some uh, here's some uh, various uh, Wolof words that we speak today. For example, banana, bogus, hausa, boko, 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 meaning fake or fraudulent, mongo. West African bongo, bozo, stupid. You all act like a bozo. You didn't know that, did you? Bozo the clown, stupid. Uh, came from uh, West Africa. Boogie, boogie. That's the Wolof of Saharan word for dance. Boogie, baby, boogie. Bukra, the white man or person. You know, hip. You know, the Wolof word hippie or hippical, one with eyes open. You know, jazz from the West African language. You know, yes, 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 yes. Jab. That's also my came from the Wolof word jab. See, and again, jukebox. But but another another word that came from Wolof was was honky. Honky. Honky means man riding on a horse. Back in the day, the Negro drive not the Negro driver, but but back in the day, the white master and the white uh and the white overseer would often ride a horse to uh, you know, to monitor the slaves working in the fields. And so when the uh, when the people when the people would see this this horseman riding, you know they would say honky 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 honky, but they didn't say honky because it was identifying in a sense the white man like we use the word honky today. Honky was identifying these the man who was riding on the horse that overseer, you know. F foundational Black American English has an African substratum and the Niger Congo historical grammar. That's what we find in uh in 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 many of the uh, aspects of our of, of of, of our language, especially in the Gullah language, we find many African words. And, and these words go back to, in a sense, that relationship between, you know, the uh, the Africans who were enslaved and also some Aboriginal people, you see. There are a number of enslaved people who were Muslims. You know, from left to right, here's some of the uh, most prominent Muslims. From left to right, we have Abdurrahman Ibrahim Ibn Sori, Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, better known as Jad bin Solomon, and then Omar ibn Said. There are a number of enslaved people who were Muslims. These include such notable West African Muslims as, as Yaru Mahmud and Abdul Rahman ibn Ibrahim Sori. The Muslim slaves were Sunni and Sufi. 
Muslim scholars like Omar Said, Abu Rahman, and Ben Ali Muhammad they organized Islamic schools spreading the Malinki peak on many American plantations, yes, yes, to ensure the transmittal of Islamic knowledge to their children. Up until the interstate slave trade that began in 1800, yes. In 1800, there was a, there was a, there was a rapid sale of slaves from the north into the uh, deep south. And so many of the slaves that were in the northern, you know, northern states, Connecticut, Maryland, places like that, they were sold to plantations in the deep south who had, a, who had a shortage of labor. Abd, Abd al-Rahman Azim, in the eternal message of Muhammad notes that, and I quote, in sanctioning war, Islam defined its aims and purposes to suppress tyranny, ensure the right of a man to his home and freedom within his nation, present persecution of religion and guarantee freedom of belief to all people. Using this as a definition, we find the majority of the objectives laid down by the Quran to the Mujahid, one who strives in the path of Allah, are those sought by Afro-Americans, or F FBA. The Quran says, and I quote, and fight them until persecu persecution is no more and religion is for Allah. Yet in the Mujahid's jihad against the Zaliman, the wrongdoers, is not to be waged if it is only taking place for the aggrandizement of the Mujahid, because many black nationals often seem to be seeking power over the masses, and thinking of themselves as the only ones possessing the knowledge and oratory techniques to lead the people. Most Sunni Muslims believe that many black nationalists are not working for the people, but are only seeking power for themselves. This, this they say, is supported by the fact face that many of the black nationalists in the 1960s did not show this. Abdul Rahman Ibrahima, he lived in Mississippi between 1788 and 1828, and he was the son of Ibrahim Sori the founder of a theocratic state at Timbo in 1776 during the jihad that took place in Furu Jalan. Okay, when you when you when you see when somebody like when somebody is named Ibn, Ibn means son. So often, often in a sense, you might you might find someone that was named Abdul Rahman Ibrahima Ibn Ibrahim Sori. That means that Abdul Rahman Ibrahima was the son Ibn of Ibrahim Sori. That's one of the reasons why you find a lot of these uh these people have these long names. Ibrahim Diallo became famous because he refused to drink wine. Upon recognition of Diallo's faith by his master, he was much kinder to him and then before allowing him to a place to pray and some other conveniences in order to make the slavery as easy as possible. Due to the British interest in securing influence and in trade with the Gambia, they helped Diallo to tell the story of his capture and returned him to Africa. Diallo, who is usually known as Job bin Solomon, after returning to his hometown, Bandu, helped free his friend, Lahaman J, a Mandingo, who had been carried to Maryland on the same ship as Diallo. Diallo is also credited writing two Qurans from memory while in England. Can you imagine that? Back in the day, if you were a Muslim in Africa, you learned to memorize the entire Quran. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine people who could who were able, in a sense, to memorize the entire Quran and could write it back in memory? And this is what some of these uh, these uh, Muslim brothers who were slaves could do. That shows that many of the uh, Muslims here were not illiterate; they were literate in Arabic. Over Omar ibn Said, he's one of the uh, He's a very interesting Muslim. One of these Muslims was Salik Bilali, called Tom by his master. Although he remained a slave for life, even after 40 years of slavery, he was still able to read and write Arabic and was a strict Mohammedan who abstained from spiritual liquors and keeps the, the various fasts, particularly that of Ramadan. Salik was a Fulani born about 1770 at Kinnak. He was held in bondage in Georgia. Another well-known Muslim slave was Omar ibn Said. He was called Moro by his master. While a slave in Fayetteville, North Carolina, he was born about 1770, 1771 in Futatoro. He studied Islamic studies until the age of 25. Omar had been sold into slavery around 1807. He had fought in the jihads of Fudo, of, uh, Fudo, Fudo, where he was an imam. He had also performed the pilgrimage to Mecca. Ibn Said escaped and settled in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where he later became a successful furniture 
maker. So you can see many of these, uh, many of these, uh, these, these, these Muslims who came to the Americas, many of them were had came, had become enslaved as a result of participation in the various jihads. Because as I told you, the Islam practiced by by the Muslims who were who were the Aztecs was different from the Islam that was practiced by later Muslims. And one of the reasons that it was different was because of the fact, in a sense, that 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 during the jihad, the jihadis, the mujahid, the mujahideens, they, in a sense, they tried to make make uh, the uh, Islamic religion in West Africa, uh, you know, the same as many of the practices of the Muslims. But they they weren't, in a sense, they didn't practice, in a sense, the uh, Saudi Arabian style is Islam, the Wahhabis. Most of the uh, West African Muslims practiced what was called the Malinki Fiq. Maroons were often allied with the Indians. Maroons lived in many Yamasi communities. The Yamasi was a tribe of black Native Americans who originally lived in Florida and Southern Georgia until they were forced to migrate into North and South Carolina by the Spanish in the 16th century. The Yamasi were part of the Muscogean Confederacy. This was the Confederacy of Mongoloid and black Native Americans. The whites began to steal the Yamasi lands. By 1715, the Yamasi leading a confederation of other tribes, attacked the whites to drive them out of their land. The Cherokee, who were part of the, the Muscogean Confederacy, broke away and formed an alliance with the British in 1718 and helped defeat the Amasi. Yes, yes, the Red Indians were always selling us out. You know, it, it's just like John Henry Clark. As he said, FBA, you have no allies. We have no allies. It must remember that there were also Aboriginal Muslims in the Americas. And again, we have to look at this picture of the Yamasi fighting the British. And you see, in a sense, that these Aboriginal people wore kufi hats. They wore turbans. Very important to understand. Note the turbans, uh, wraps of, you could say, do-rags and kufi hats worn by the Yamasis in this picture. Let's take a, I'll take a few seconds, a minute to maybe kind of observe it. The Washington Nation was the first black Native Americans to reclaim their Muslim heritage. Here we see a picture of Noble Drew Ali. He's a founder of the Moore Scientist. He is also part black Native American. Look, look, look at what he wore. Look at his outfit. You see? Look at that. Look at that. Look at it in a sense, his uh, semi kufi turban with a feather in it. And and what makes it so interesting is that we find that that this garb, this garb that 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 he wore is the same garb worn by this brother who was a Yamasi soldier when he wore a turban with a feather in it. Some of the Malians were Muslims. The best evidence of Muslims in North America was the Jamazi or the Yamasi. In this picture, in the picture, we can see the Moors wearing turbans and kufi hats fighting the British. Yes, yes, yes. Here, let's look at this picture again. Here we see a colonial and modern Muslim. The picture of Noble Drew Ali, the founder of the Moor Scientist Temple, on the left-hand side, continued the tradition of wearing Moorish military garb going back to the colonial period of the United States. Stop, stop, stop it. Stop it. Stop thinking that our culture always goes back to somebody else. Here you see Noble Drew Ali. He's wearing the same outfit that the Yamasi was wearing in 1715 AD. We don't have to wait for no daggone Pakistanis or or, or, or so Saudi Arabians, or or some more, or somebody from Morocco. We already had our own tradition here. Stop it. Stop letting Europeans tell you lies about our history. In summary, Muslims early, early planted Islam in the Western Hemisphere. It would appear that the first Muslims in the United States belonged to the Mali Empire and probably belonged to the expeditionary force led by Abu Bakari. This would explain the Aztec Muslims. The legacy, the legacy of Muslims in America extends beyond the colonial period, with descendants of African Muslims continuing to practice Islam and preserve their cultural heritage. Scholars like myself have contributed valuable research on the historical and cultural significance of Afro-Muslim communities in the Americas, shedding light on their enduring impact on American society. Further exploration of this rich and complex history is essential for understanding the diverse tapestry of America of American
foundation of Black American identity. The brand of Islam practiced by the Malians would have included African elements. The Moors of Europe were great navigators and they early established trade relations with the aboriginals in America. Later after the discovery of America by Columbus led to Moriscos and later enslaved African Muslims reintroducing Islam to the Americas. You see, this slide presentation has attempted to illustrate that Afro-Muslims have continued to practice Islamic rights up to today. Yes, up to today. Muslim rights practiced by FBA before Caucasians came to the Americans. Finally, Muslims must have been an integral part of the American history since the colonial era, contributing to the colonial, social, and religious landscape of the United States. Despite the challenges of slavery and colonization, Muslim enslaved individuals preserved and practicing their faith and preserving their cultural heritage. Their legacy lives on in the vibrant communities of, of Foundation of Black American Muslims today, highlighting the resistance and diversity of the American experience. Yes, 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 yes. Join my, join my Patreon. You know, you can get these slides when you join my Patreon, and I have a good bibliography, and this bibliography can tell you further uh, uh, articles that you can read and books that will help you to get an understanding of the uh, history of Blacks here. Go to my Patreon to see the slides, you see. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Clyde Winners 8. Follow me at TikTok.com, Clyde Winners 3, to view my shorts. Uh, Quinn Yoshima Nuzzit put some beautiful shorts on. So a lot of young people on TikTok are getting to know me. Go there, check them out. Uh, you're on my, uh, YouTube, uh, my YouTube channel. Here I have over 300 YouTube videos. You can order my books at Amazon.com. Don't forget... If you want to find out more about Muslims in the Americas, not just Muslims in North America, see, but if you want to find out more, get my book, The Soul of Islam. In this, in this I give you a full history of is Islam and Muslims in the Americas throughout on every, every South America, North America, Canada, the Caribbean, all of the histories of Muslims, Black Muslims who lived in that area, you're going to find in my book, The Soul of Islam. And if you want to find out more about African civilizations and history, get my book, The World History of the Black Race, you see. And uh, of course, get my book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals of America. This is a, is a book that you need to get. Get that book. You see, it's very important in a sense that, that we understand, that we understand in a sense that, that there's a lot of interesting information that you can learn, you see. For example, we know that we know that that Yoshimad has, has presented some very important information that we all need to learn. And uh, and because we all need to learn it, we should try to support Yoshimad, you know, uh, because the Yoshimad, in a sense, what he's trying to do is he's trying to give us an opportunity to learn more about our history. So you, you should want to check out these um, this uh, material that's been created by Yoshimad. Let's take a look. Hey V1 family, I'm excited to tell you about something super special and educational. This Black History Month, Yoshi Ma has created an amazing collection of PDFs all about incredible Black inventors and their amazing achievements. Do you know about Mae Jemison, the first FBA woman astronaut? Or Percy Julian, who made groundbreaking discoveries in chemistry? These are just a couple of the amazing people you'll learn about in these PDFs. These PDFs are perfect for teachers, homeschooling parents, or anyone who loves learning. They're filled with fun facts and inspiring stories that make learning about Black history exciting. Only $3 for a journey through history with some of the most influential Black inventors and scientists. Just click the link in the description to grab your copies from Yoshi Mod's Gumroad store. And don't forget to check out Yoshi Mod's other amazing creations and music on Spotify. Let's learn, have fun, and celebrate Black history together. Okay. Yoshi Mod is also presenting some very important uh, information that can help you to be able to learn more about, uh, you know, some of his work.
Yushi Mod Productions, we're here to take your brand and creativity to new heights. From EPKs to AI commercials, animated music commercials to animated AI bios, book covers to picture flyers, and so much more, we've got you covered. Our team is dedicated to delivering high quality, cutting edge designs that leave a lasting impression. And for our valued clients, we offer exceptional creativity, a customer-centric approach, and work that reflects the latest trends and technologies. Just about making art, we're about creating experiences. Your brand, your vision, our artistry. Professionalism and reliability are the cornerstones of everything we do. We're more than a service, we're your creative partners. If you're ready to make your brand shine, look no further than Yoshimod Productions. Join us in the journey of creativity. Contact us today and let's make your vision a reality. Okay, again, uh, you know, check out Yoshi Mod and uh, and support him and his uh, and his work because uh, you know he's uh, doing a lot of good stuff that can help a lot of you. Okay, how you doing, Team uh, Team Zulu and uh, Joan? Uh, thank you, fascinating doc. Thanks once again. Oh, thank you. I mean, uh, the thing is, this is that it's stuff we need to know. Uh, Tone Five says, Tone Five says, thank you. So much, Dr. Klein. When is of course, and as and again, as I said, is that Tones Fi, he makes some very beautiful jewelry, and this and this and this jewelry that he makes is based upon Aboriginal stuff. He, he's uh, what he, what what uh, what he's done is that Tones Fi has he's 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 looked at some of the uh, the materials that have that have been discovered in the mounds, and he's copied some of these works. So check him out. Check him out. We show his commercial every Sunday. When uh, me and Yoshima do uh, do our show on, uh, you know, on that that deals in a sense with what's going on in the world, check it, this man out. Buy his products, you know. T.W., how you doing? What up, dude? And T.W. says, uh, he says, thank you, Doctor Winters. Again, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you guys. And uh, we got a few more minutes, so uh, if if there's any questions, uh, you know, put them in the chat, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. But as I told you is that I wanted you to see is that a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff that, that the European teaches you when a lot, when they, when they try to tell you that the Moors weren't here, you know, you know, when, when, when they tell you that the Moors wasn't here, this, this is all, this is a, this is all just, just a lie, you know, you know, and, and, and the thing is, this is that we have so much great research. How are you doing Dion Epps? Dion Epps. And see, the thing is, this is that you have to do research. That's why I teach my course. You know, many of the people that's taken my course, you know, such as Sister Shanice, uh, uh, you know, B-Man, B-Man Ra, these, these brothers and sisters, they've written books. They've been doing the research. And this is what it's all about. It's, it's trying to get you to understand the truth. You know, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that they do, this is probably the first time, it's probably the first time that you've ever learned about the Moors, how the Moors got to the Americas, how the Moors were already over here, how Europeans already knew about knew about the Muslims. They knew about Islam. Yes, they knew about Islam. They knew that Muslims was over here. They didn't come over here blind. You know, like Columbus, though he discovered, he didn't discover America. He had maps. And these maps, in a sense, he had maps. And, and these maps came from what? These maps came from the Moors who lived over there in in, in, in Iberia, Spain. These maps came from Moors that, that lived in Britain. They knew all this stuff. You see? They knew all this stuff. You see? They want you to believe in the sense that, that everything had to come from the white man or the white Arab. But you can see in the sense that we already had our own civilization. There was already Islam being practiced here. That 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 when they, a lot of stuff they teach you about the Aztecs is ish. It's bullish. Because the reality, in a sense, is that these people had a much more diversified and to understand their religion. Yes, you will see some of these these elements that may not, in a sense, have been exactly Islamic practices. But that's because the fact is that that's how Islam was practiced in the 1300s before the jihads. 
And if you notice, it was the jihads that led to so many Muslims coming over here as, as slaves. Look at look at what the what the Wolofs have done. You know, look at what the Wolof had did in America. JP loved the book, Soul of Islam, great information, great information on Muslim in America, and their strength and fight against slavery. Yes, yes, yes. JP, thank you. You know, and this is uh, what we have to do. We have to, in a sense, see that that this information is out there. And then we have uh, this uh, comment by uh, T.W. Dr. Winters, when I see documentaries from Spain about the Moors, they usually call the Moors Arabs. It's almost it's almost the word black is like kryptonite. Anything but black. Of course they do that. Nobody wants to use black. That's why it's, it's a shame that every time they talk about things that affect us over here, instead of saying, oh, the black Americans or the foundational Americans or even African Americans, they always say black and brown you know, people of color, see? Because, see, the thing is, this is that. If they, if they tell you, if they tell you that it was black people, if they tell you about the architecture, if they tell you about the beautiful civilization that, that was bequeathed to the, uh, to, the, to the Europeans, then in a sense, you would say, damn, it was done by black people? No, they say Arabs. There wasn't no Arabs. Yeah, the Arabs, the only Arabs, when they, the only people who would have been Arabs would have been Saracens. And there are very few Saracens. You, you found most of, most of your Arabs may have been down in Italy. The vast majority of other people were Moors. And see, this is one of the things that you forget is that when they talk, when they talk about, when they talk about, in a sense, these navigators, you know, you've assumed that these navigators, the so-called Vikings, had to have been, had to have been, in a sense, some white folks. But they weren't white folks. The Vikings were blacks. The Danes were black, you see. How you doing, Sister Shanice? What up, no? See, you know, and this is and this is the most important thing to understand. The most important thing to understand is this: is that you have to do your research. You have to do your research. You have to, in a sense, follow the leads. You know, you have to follow the leads, and and the information is out there. You see, it, it, it's almost it's almost like it's almost like when they used to talk about the, uh, you know, it's almost like when they used to talk about. Uh, in this old TV show, um, and they would say, oh, the, the truth is out there. Yes, the truth is out there, you know. And and it is so true. Tone, Tone Spy says, you know, is one of the oldest universities in Timbuktu? Yes, yes. That's one of the oldest, oldest universities in Africa. And in, and in the city of Timbuktu, they have thousands and thousands of books, you know, you know. You know, and this is, this is so true. You know, just like this comment by Team Zulu, at TW, if they say the blacks did it, then dang, near all their his all their story will also be corrected. Yes, when they talk about the Renaissance, the Renaissance, the Renaissance in a sense, that was just a period of the of the uh, of the of the of the, of the Muslim, the black Muslim, giving them in a sense, giving them information leading to this thing. You know, Sister Janice, thank you for this, thank you for this kindness that you're sharing. Rise up, rise up, family. Dr. Winners dropping gold nuggets as always. Keep firing. Oh! I got I to gotta keep firing because, see, we need this research. You know, we need the research. That's it. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. It was called The X-Files. It was a good show. And that's what it is. That's what, the, that's what our, our history is. The history is out there. But, but until, we, until we do the research, until we check it out, until we provide, in a sense, a base of knowledge, then people will not know about our great history. People will not know about our contribution. Today, I'm, I'm, today I've been trying for years. I've had about five. Uh, I've had about five classes, four classes, research classes. And I've been trying to get somebody to do some research on the Moors. But I'm trying. I'm trying to add stuff to the Moors because we really don't have a good history of the Moors. Because see. Up until now, this is the first time you probably heard that the Vikings, that the Vikings were, in a sense, that the Vikings were black, that the Vi that the Danes were black, you know. And that and that is and that is uh, and that is that is so important for understand is that the knowledge is out there, you see. It's out there. But we had to do the research and we had to publicize the research, you see. We have all, we have a lot of people out there that are talking about this history or that history. But they don't talk about our, our true history because they're waiting until the European says it. 
because they feel that the European said it, then other black people will believe them. But the point is this is that when you go and get the receipts, when you go and do the original research, then you're able, yes, yes, when you do the research yourself, you're able in a sense to see, is this true or is it a lie? And sadly, much of what we know about the world, much of what we know about ancient history is a lie and, and, and medieval history, you see? I already showed you how, how Muslims, you know, were, were building multi-story multi-story buildings. They had, they had apartment buildings that was two, three, four stories high. Those castles they built, the, the architecture, all this architecture was done. All the architecture was done in Europe by black Moors. And yet they try to take credit of it. They try to, in a sense, maybe copy off the Greeks and Romans, but a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the architecture. The average, the average stockade or, or, or castle, the average, the average, uh, the average uh, building. These things were done first by the Moors, see. And these Moors were not Arabs, and they were not they were not Berbers. They came from Senegal. See, they came from Senegal, and they continued. More and more people over years would migrate to to Cordova, Iberia go into Germany and other places. And they would spread this great culture and this great civilization. Okay, uh, I don't I don't see uh, any questions, so we'll, we can uh, maybe call it an evening. Thank you, uh, thank you for showing up. And uh, I'd like to share with you a couple of uh, commercials before we leave, uh, you know, concerning uh, some of my books. So uh, let's, uh, that's a couple of things to run past you. You know. issue now is that you know places like all over the country they're trying to uh, stop our kids from uh, learning our history in the schools some of us are going to have to set up some after school programs and uh today is today we need to homeschool our children due to white supremacy in many states education departments are passing laws to deny our children from learning the history of foundational black americans today you can learn how to organize your children and teach your children in a homeschool. In my book, A Guide to Homeschool, Foundational Black Americans. You can use my book, History of Blacks in America from Prehistory to 1877 to teach our children their, their history, their history here in the United States. You can use my book to teach world history. And this book I've written is called the world history of the black world. This will teach your children about every black civilization in the world. Get this book. The time is now. Get these books to teach your children about their greatness, to prevent them from losing confidence in their own ability to learn and be successful future adults in employment and education. And uh, finally, I'm so very proud of, of my book that I just wrote on the uh, history and culture of Aboriginals. It's the only book that you're going to find that, that provides you with a history of the foundational Black American Aboriginal. So dreamy. Hey, so I've just written a new book, History and Culture of the Black Aboriginals of America. Yes, yes, I've written a new book. This book is called History and Culture of Afro-Americans. It's the, about the Aboriginal Americans. It's about the first people who inhabited America. Many people don't know about our great culture, this super culture that we created, but I discussed this book. In 489 pages, you'll find out so much information, great information, about, in a sense, what uh, the Aboriginal Foundational Black Americans did. You're going to see, in a sense, that Black people contributed much here. When the first Europeans got here, that's what they found. Yes, they found Black Aboriginals inhabiting the Americas. It was the black aboriginals that built this country. This is why you had to get my book, get my book, History and Culture of the Aboriginal Blacks of the, the Americas. In this book, you will find out the truth. You will know what we created. You will know who we are. Get this book. Buy it now. 
Again, uh, it's uh, very important that, uh, you know, I hope you'll get some of those books or buy any of my other books. But the most important thing to keep in mind is this is that, that the truth is out there. Knowledge about our history is out there. How you doing, Cologne? And uh, and uh, Pamela X, you know, it's very important that we understand this, you see, you know, is that knowledge is power, but knowledge can only come when you want to seek it out because you can't wait for other people to tell you who you are. You can't wait for other people, in a sense, to lead you down a path that is going to lead you nowhere. As Dan Epp said, good evening, everybody. Have a good night. Bye.